quite privileged. Uh, we're not just getting Professor Bill Mitchell once, we're getting him twice for the conference. So um, Bill's going to talk uh, today on a very uh, important new initiative. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with Bill, if you, especially if you attended yesterday, but there might be some people who didn't attend the conference yesterday and uh, here for the first time. So I'll say a few things about Bill. Uh, Bill Mitchell is Emeritus Professor of Economics and Director of the Centre of Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle, New South Wales. Uh, the centre, affectionately known as COFFEE, uh, aims to advance research and policies that can restore full employment and achieve a society that delivers equitable outcomes for all. Through COFFEE, Bill has spent much time and effort devising and promoting a job guarantee, an institutional mechanism de designed to achieve and maintain a low inflation form of full employment. Bill also holds a position as docent professor in global political economy at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Bill is one of the major intellectual forces behind the initial establishment and subsequent development of modern monetary theory, uh, which of course you're learning quite a bit about at this particular conference. Bill has written and published widely in books and academic, academic journals and regularly gives presentations at seminars and conferences worldwide. Bill's latest co-authored book, which called Macroeconomics, which Bill uh, talked a bit about yesterday, um, offers a coherent alternative to a mainstream form of macroeconomics that has failed in recent decades to deliver full employment and which has also contributed in no small way to the widening gap between rich and poor. I encourage you to, uh, all to read his, uh, this particular book and many other books authored and co-authored by Bill in recent years. On top of all his achievements, Bill finds time to write a regular blog piece, and by regular I mean three or four times a week, I don't know how he does it, that can be found at his popular blog site, Billy Blog. Uh, I thoroughly recommend his blog site to each and every one of you. Besides his academic and social welfare advancing pursuits, Bill is a professional musician and avid cyclist and runner. Uh, if the opportunity presents itself when you're in Melbourne, I encourage you to see Bill play guitar with his band Pressure Drop. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> So today Bill will be talking about a green transition frame, framework for the future, so I invite Bill to the podium. Thanks. So you'll see I've got a different tie on today. Now I just want to make it clear that I grew up in Melbourne and we wish the Crows and Port Adelaide had have stayed out of it. <laughs> and I was going to do a survey and get everybody to stand up who hated the Crows and Port Adelaide and I'm sure almost everybody in the room would have got up. <laughs> Go the D's. <laughs> I didn't hear it, sorry. So the takeaway from today always put your conclusion at the beginning, I was told when I was a young academic, is MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, have, really has very little to say about <coughs> climate action and what I call the green transition. But what it has to say is extremely important and is, in my view, the game changer. And you're not, we're not going to get effective and a progressive, which is a different thing from effective, uh, uh, transition to green unless we do it through an MMT framework. And the, the other point that I'm going to make is that this is both a social and, and an environmental challenge. It's not just an environmental challenge. And that'll become apparent later what I mean by that. And this was a quote by a Canadian trade unionists that influenced me when I was a young academic in the mid-90s. The real choice is not jobs or environment, it's both or neither. And that, the, the meaning of that will become apparent as I speak, one hopes, if I do my job. Now what MMT's got to say about green transition, climate change and all the rest of it, it answers the question that all the conservatives and all of the faux progressives will will immediately ask 
when you outline the scale of the radical transformation that our societies are going to have to go through, how do you pay for it? That's the, that's the sticking point that those who want to derail it will always use that in a malicious way. And, and those who don't want to derail it but are uneducated will use it in an ignorant way and then come up with uh, gee whiz plans to solve how you pay for it which will just worsen the problem. And so what MMT can, what modern monetary theory allows us to do is completely divert the question of how we're going to pay for it. There's no question, no question at all that our currency issuing governments will be able to fund the resource shifts that are required to meet the climate change if that's scientifically possible. There's no question that our current institution governments will be able to pay for this, the transformation if we give it political legitimacy to do so. And the other thing that MMT can help us decide is what are we going to pay for? And uh, those two questions really then, once we've solved them, that's the end of MMT. So I've just put myself out of a bit of a job in our future world because it becomes quite easy, eh? And that's the end of MMT's relevance. So what I want to talk about now is, well, what else is to be done within a progressive framework? And I prefer to talk about a green transition. I dislike Green New Deal because I think we don't need in this country to import American cultural artefacts. I also don't think that we need to be party to a revision and a misuse of history because if you know about the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, that's what we call a cyclical stimulus. It was a short-term fiscal injection to meet a collapse in non-government spending so that communities, particularly rural com communities, but not exclusively, could survive and have jobs, uh, work and jobs and incomes to get through that period while the economy recovered from the 1929 financial collapse. It was never meant to be a major transformation of the uh, uh, American economy, it was never meant to be a fundamental shift between the public sector and the private sector in terms of command and use of, of the resources. And in actual fact, Roosevelt was a fiscal conservative who was reluctantly dragged into the New Deal and, and stopped it as soon as he could. So for us to be wanting to attach ourselves to what is going to have to be a massive structural transformation in our consumption and production patterns, which is going to have to represent a massive shift in the, the way we conceive government and the division of government and uh, non-government in the use of resources, in the imposition of regulations and policy uh, coercion on non-government activity, that's, a, that's not a cyclical shift. And uh, we should therefore not be trying to sort of be cute with history and call it a new deal. Uh, so that's why I prefer green transition. That's what we're calling it. In, I'll, I'll say who we are in a moment uh, in general terms. Uh, and I think that we can avoid that cultural artefact from the United States in our own country. So this is a neoliberal support report card. I think I'm just going to do, just put it up there because uh, the, the gentleman that spoke earlier read out his speech, told us all about it. The housing uh, person told us all about it. Alison told us all about it. We've heard it for two days. We've lived it. We know it. And what we've come to, to know is that across a whole range of things that matter to us, uh, the report card is a failure. It's a dramatic failure. And the, uh, the final conclusion is that it's a social and environmental failure. It's just not an environmental failure. And the two are intrinsically interlinked. And they're interlinked with that second last dot point 
that they're interlinked with, as a major policy failure with the government surplus, and government is both sides of politics in this country, not just the Conservatives. The Labor Party are unelectable in this country because they've got these surplus obsessions. They don't even understand what surpluses are, really. They don't understand the damage that surpluses do. They don't understand that surpluses destroy non-government wealth, our wealth, but they pursue it notwithstanding, and that pursuit has created such a narrow policy space that it's allowed all sorts of things that should have been done for many years to not be done, and we're in this position. So we've got a crisis. I think I think it was Alison said something about a war. We've got a cri or was it the housing lady. We've got a war on our hands. Crisis means crisis. Now, why not rely on the market? Well, what I mean by this is, if you look at the policy platforms of our three major parties, they've all got variations of market-based solutions to the climate crisis. All of them. And what I mean by a market-based solution, it's working through what economists call the price system. And so what you need to do, what they say is, well, the, the reason we've got a climate crisis is because the price of carbon using activities is not reflective of the true cost. And so all we need to do is really adjust the price so that it reflects the true costs. And then via substitution by consumers, uh, as the product prices of those, uh, those outputs rise, consumers will substitute away and will get a optimal in economic language, not my language, but mainstream economic language, you'll get an optimal mix of polluting activities and non-polluting activities. Now, the reason we, that's what we mean by a market system, well, that's, that's, just, that's just the neoliberal way of thinking, that everything can be done through a market. And it amounts to a conception that our atmosphere can be privatised. And... If you understand the literature and the practical experience of offset schemes, carbon offset schemes, that's a big debate in Australia at the moment, we'll have offsets. Well, if you examine, and, and, and I urge you to become familiar with the earliest type of these uh, uh, trading schemes, which was in the, uh, uh, the European Union scheme, the way in which the offset schemes in third world countries, less developed countries, have operated, have been disastrous for local communities, local cultures, local sustainability. So it amounts to big polluters in rich countries doing some stuff in less rich countries, wrecking them, and then claiming them as credit so that they can keep polluting in, in the rich countries. The, 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 and this is all market-based, been disastrous and markets are insensitive to equity issues. So one of the first things you learn as a progressive young economist is that price systems are invariant to distributional matters. Because in the market all that matters is the price and the vote, and the vote is the dollar that you bring to the market, and so who's got the most dollars will get the best votes in the market. And as a progressive person, I don't want a system uh, to be reliant on a system that doesn't take equity and put equity as a primary decision-making criteria on. And most importantly, and why it's in bold, is that my profession has this idea of this trade-off, that you have an optimal amount of pollution uh, uh, regulated or mediated through the price system. As long as the prices are appropriately scaled to the true cost, then you'll get an optimal amount of pollution. That's what you get taught in second year microeconomics, third year, and then by the time you graduate, you're writing equations about the same thing, nothing much, uh, no substance, just a lot of hocus. And... Uh, uh, Paul Sweezy once said, by the way, that uh, mainstream economics basically starts, converts you into an idiot in first year, uh, someone who's basically just full of jargon, 
uh, and then by fifth year you just write mathematics for it. Uh, and so the, 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 the point is that markets are insensitive to biological systems. I don't know when a river system is going to die. There is no conception that an economist who, wrote, who de uh, designs a market system, they can't tell you when a, a biological system is going to collapse. So there's no scientific way of assessing a trade-off. There's no such thing as an optimal amount of pollution. In other words, we have to be incredibly cautious in our behaviour, incredibly risk-averse, and not rely on the price system and think it's all going to be fine if we just match prices with costs. And so I've always advocated for many years that I've been working in this policy area, a rules-based approach, using the legislative and regulative capacity of our federal governments uh, through the constitutional system to state and local governments, and a rules-based approach doesn't rely on price system, it relies on us making decisions that are in the best interests of the society and using the legislative capacity of the, our governments to then tell people, tell industry and groups what they're going to do. And the, an application for that, I live in uh, mostly in Newcastle, it's the largest export coal port in the world. All day, every day, the coal's getting sh shunted out. And uh, it comes from up the Hunter Valley, of course, on the trains. And uh, my approach to uh, uh, the, that issue, give them a sunset clause 10 years, 20 years, to, uh, as advised by proper climate science, not by me, I haven't got a clue. Uh, and we just tell them they're shutting down, that's it, for end. And... Uh, And when I've said that, it uh, started saying that quite a bit younger than I am now, there'd be death threats from unions turning up telling me that, and I won't mention the union, you can guess which one it is. And in that type of rules-based approach, the government becomes a central player uh, as, as a voice for us, not as an autocratic, coercive policy, uh, 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 agent, but as a voice for us. And that, of course, requires substantial political reform in our, in our democratic processes. So we're adding layers of complexity as I, as I go through this talk. Now, the other thing is I hear is this idea that, uh, uh, and I have sympathy for it, but no time for it. And this, the, the idea is that, look, we've got a climate crisis on our hands. And uh, if we try to marry that to some liberal social agenda, like fair work, like good wages, like good retirement conditions, like good schooling, good hospitals, good public transport, all the things that a, a progressive social democrat would desire in our societies, the argument is if we try to marry the climate action with that, then we'll just get rid of the right wing will never buy into it. But if we just keep focus on the climate issue, everybody can buy into that and will make action. So we leave the liberal, social, demo, uh, progressive agenda aside, forget it, and just solve the climate problem. But if you go back to the report card, my hypothesis and assertion is that the climate issue can't be divorced from the social issue, that it's, that it's causally linked. And so if we really want to truly solve the climate issue in a progressive way with equity up there at the top, fairness, you know, I grew up in Australia where we were told we had the fair go here. We were an egalitarian society. It's, it's one of the many delusions that Australians have of us ourselves. We're a vindictive, pernicious, individualistic society. And we've got to, we've got to stop that. And I'm not sure that was worthy of a clap because it really, really makes me upset. And the, the point is that therefore it's got to be a joint attack on the problem. That we re what we're really talking about here is an attack on neoliberalism. Not getting, not getting sidetracked into being focused just on climate issues. It's a, what we've got to mount as progressives is an attack on neoliberalism. Now then the question, 
and the complexity goes up a bit further, then the question is, are we talking about here challenging the very basis of the capitalist mode of production? That's what we're talking about. Are we talking now about system change? And, well, I've got my views on that, and I'm sure they're not necessarily the same as everybody's views, but that's, that's a question that I don't think we talk about much. Yeah, we'll have a little bit of an emission trading system here and stuff like that, but I think we've got to think about fundamentally redefining our productive system. And so we talk about just transition, feeding into climate action. You'll note that I've now got the people and the social element as the starting point, because unless we alter human behaviour and make, give people an incentive to change their behaviour, we're not going to get climate action. Now, we can get it if we lock everybody up who turns on a, a light switch too often, but we don't want that sort of society. So we've got to address the vicissitudes of neoliberalism at the, on social grounds to get the climate action. And that's what I'm calling green transition. Now, I got first started thinking about this in the mid-90s when I came across the work of Brian Kohler, who was a trade union official in Canada, and he, they, that particular union were fighting major issues with respect to closure of very polluting uh, uh, plants that had a lot of chemical pollution. And Brian Kohler said, the real choice is not jobs or environment, it is both or neither. And what he was saying was, it's a bit of text, that if you really go into a community where the workers' lives are dependent for their mortgages, for their self-esteem, for their status, for their relativities, uh, for their children's future, for their retirement, and all of the things that all of us care about, if you go into a community where those workers are working in a polluting plant and you just lobby to get the plant shut down, then those workers are likely to resist and join that political forces with the bosses, who don't, with capital. You'll get a merger of labour and capital fighting against that and you probably won't get what you want. And in, in a way in Australia we've got that in the coal industry. With the, the, the big multinational coal companies and the CFMEU. And I can completely understand the resistance of the CFMEU to, to, to closing down coal at this stage because the issue is being constructed as closing down the livelihoods of all those workers and giving them nothing in return. And I've had a lot of struggles with the Greens over my career where they'll go into a, a community, say in Victoria and New South Wales, depending where I was living at the time, saying we can't keep uh, 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 cutting down those uh, forests for timber and then they go back to Sydney. And of course the communities are not going to buy into that. That's their livelihoods. And that's what Brian Kohler was saying. That was the, the genesis of, of the concept of just transition. And in the, uh, a few years later, my research centre started doing work for Greenpeace at the beginning on closing down coal-fired power stations in New South Wales. And we started to build the concept of a just transition framework in the early 2000s based upon this notion that jobs had to be up front and alternatives had to be provided or you'd get nowhere. Now this is our, our little matrix that we've, we're currently, this is my, our green transition framework and uh, let's quickly go through it, transparency and planning. Uh, this morning some per people were talking about uh, consultation and, and uh, inclusion in decision making. You c we're not going to get anywhere unless communities, uh, whether the, unless the process is legitimate, which means that the communities have to buy into it and be part of the process and be fully informed. Uh, we need planning. You know, uh, I grew up in a time where we had elaborate federal government and regional labour market and regional plans, state government regional plans. And of course in the 
uh, 1980s, once Hawke and Keating got their hands on the levers, and then that morphed, that neoliberalism morphed into Hawke and Ke uh, not Hawke, uh, Howard and Costello and so on, they, they abandoned all of that, that planning environment, the occupational planning, the skill development planning that was feeding into a full employed economy, the regional development plan to match the social settlement with the economic settlement, that was all abandoned because the market would do it. Well, that pl planning is a dirty word for neoliberalism because what it implies is that, that, that uh, our capital, and particularly multinational capital, are going to have to not run wild and do what they want. And now we've got state governments with these PPPs that have really outsourced urban infrastructure planning to private equity groups. And that's got to stop. Funding and logistics support. Now, this is tied into these. A lot. These are all interlinked. Uh, there, there's, this is going to require massive investments, and it's only our federal government, as the currency issuer, who's going to have the resort financial capacity to do this. So the and it's highly likely that for many years, fiscal deficits will have to be substantial. See you later, surplus obsession. You'll never achieve it with surplus obsession. Obsession. I was in Europe recently talking to some of the big investment uh, banks, and they're telling me their big thing is green bonds. And I, I, I was on a panel with a, a Greens leader in a particular country. I won't say which one. And she said, "What we've got to do? This is the Greens." What we've got to do is get the financial markets involved. Well, the last thing we want is the financial markets to commodify this process for themselves. If the financial markets get their hands on any of this, see you later. And so reducing financial barriers is about uh, small cooperatives and start-ups and uh, uh, failing because of lack of working capital. And uh, uh, we need a framework where we uh, uh, provide start-up money for, for cooperatives uh, that are community-based, the old cooperative model, where workers have the power and the decision-making capacity and communities are sitting on the decision-making boards. I'm not talking about giving handouts to large corporations who are part of the problem. Public banks and pensions, this is related to financing. My view is that the Australian government should tomorrow in put legislation to nationalise the banking system. Yeah. The, the, the banks are essentially guaranteed by our governments. We've been following in the Royal Commission, and even though the Royal Commission was... Uh, straight-jacketed by the government so that it limited its terms of reference and cut it short. It could have gone on for five years, I reckon, what they didn't discover yet. The banks are essentially corrupt, self-serving and don't advance public purpose and we don't need them. We can have a uh, public bank, no problem. But if in the transition, then we have to have major regulative uh, changes to our banking sector such that every asset they create has to stay on their balance sheet and can't become a speculative asset, a derivative asset, if we want to do that. Uh, banks can't speculate on food, which they do currently, buying up, uh, participating in derivative products that buy up corn stocks, for example, store them, hold them long, so waiting for the price to rise, and starving communities in... in uh, poorer countries who depend upon that corn for nutrition, all of that's got to stop. Removing price distortions in the interim, we may want to have a carbon tax. Uh, now, I don't necessarily weight all these things equally. These are just parts of a, a credible story. And this is to re these price distortions are uh, that the, the factory that's pumping out the smoke doesn't pay for the damage to the environment. 
and the carbon tax idea is you make them pay for that, the price of their product goes up, consumers shift away from that product to something that's cheaper and then that reduces the output of that stuff. We might want to do that. We need massive R&D and, uh, that, uh, and that need, means we've got to rethink our university system, the sector that I've worked in all my life. And uh, uh, you know, my own university gets uh, money from guess who to do guess what. Uh, uh, even though there's no such thing as clean coal. But we've got to pump a lot of money, public money, that's motivated by public purpose, not advancing private profit, into the university and research centres like CSIRO and what have you, to, to build a scientific and technological base to allow us to do this stuff. Redeployment and relocation. The, the reality is that some regions are not going to be viable. And we need to have one of the problems of, uh, of deindustrialisation has been that uh, you know people like me uh, have an international labour market. My job vacancies are can be everywhere. I've got a job in Finland, and I have no financial barriers to getting on a uh, uh, driving or getting on a plane and going anywhere. Professional people don't, and I can almost. Not almost, because I probably couldn't afford to live in Sydney, but most professional people don't have housing issues that we heard earlier today, just, just before. Whereas low-income workers, who are the ones who suffer the disproportionate loss of, loss of uh, jobs and, and opportunity when, when a region is being deindustrialised, are stuck there because they can't afford to move into a new housing area where jobs might be into a new region. And so if a worker wants to make it, and by the way, most people don't want to relocate. And that comes back later, soon. We need jobs where, you know, this is the matching of the social and the economic settlement. Economic settlements where jobs and activity are. Social settlements are where we live with our families. And historically, we've tried to match them through regional development plans. And in the market era, we've, that, that's fractured now. So in, out in New South Wales, for example, a lot of those towns are becoming a geriatric holding cell. As the young people have moved, the services are thinning out. Distance to a grocer is now getting massive. Doctors and lawyers have left. Probably good that the lawyers have gone. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the people are just getting older. And that's because we've got this mismatch between set, the, the two different settlements that, that are important parts of our lives. So the government has to create uh, redeployment and relocation structures. Skill development is going to be important. And I quite hear quite a lot of people say, oh, well, uh, MMT supports low school jobs. Well, who says that? Whoever said that? I've, I was one of the founders. Whoever said that? What's likely, and if you watch that video from yesterday, Warren and I, we talk about high-skilled work. And my understanding is the sort of jobs that are going to be required in a renewable green economy are going to be quite high-skilled, requiring a lot of discretion and a lot of talent and a lot of t capacity. Well, we've, and we heard before, earlier, about the demolition of our vocational training system. It's shocking what's happened. Not long ago, I, I was uh, consulted by a private employment provider who was providing IT skill development. And the bastard told me that they had Windows 98 on their computers. <laughs> now, I don't use Windows, but that's pretty old. So we're going, to need, we're going to have to revitalise our whole skill development system. That means apprentices and other vocational areas. And what I mean by apprentices are not the, not the two Bob apprentices that the uh, Howard government brought in, the McDonald's apprentices. We need real skills again. Not the apprenticeships you can get in 12 weeks. Uh, we're going to have to have massive public infrastructure. Now, it took me five hours of flying to get here from Newcastle the other day. And I go to Melbourne regularly for work, and that takes me several hours. 
well, what? It's already it's already known that I could get to Melbourne from Newcastle in three hours at a at a cost recovery price of seventy dollars if we had a high speed train. The other day I was in uh, went from Tokyo to Kyoto. It's about two hundred and sixty k. We got there in uh, just over two hours, I think. No, that's not true. No, it's about 680k and we got there in two hours. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and I did the calculation. It takes three hours to get from Newcastle to Sydney by train at present. Well, that would, I could get there in 38 minutes on a high-speed train. And we've, you know, it, I've, since I've been an adult, there's been debates about high-speed train in Australia and the government says we can never afford it. Well, if there's enough steel and some workers who can lay it, then we can afford it because the government can buy anything that it wants that's available for sale. And so I'm talking here about big public infrastructure, public sector job creation. Now you'll note that 12 is job guarantee and 10 is public sector job creation. They're not the same thing because when I was younger, the, pub the public sector played a major employment role in skilled, professional, uh, technical, sub-professional, unskilled job creation. You could always get a job in the public sector. And uh, uh, in Australian history, the skill development arm of our labour market and the public employment arm were intrinsically linked because the private employers have never done much skill development. So where did the Qantas and TAA and ANSET get their pilots from? The RAF. Where did all the private construction companies get their builders from? The apprenticeships offered by housing and industry. And roads and railways and you know, transport and all the rest of it. And so we shouldn't be scared and we should advocate that advocate that we want a larger public sector and a larger public employment presence, pro developing employment opportunities not based upon whether it's going to provide returns to a narrow shareholding group that some of many of which are overseas residents, and that's not any xenophobia being expressed there. It's it's a class comment. And uh, we shouldn't be worried that uh, we want a whole stack of public activities doing stuff that helps the green transition and provides good jobs, secure jobs, all the things that Alison was talking about. Public partnerships, I hear this relates back to funding and logistics support, reducing financial barriers. These are partnerships between small cooperative startups, progressive community organisations and the public sector. Public sector's got the money, has got strategic uh, uh, capacity, has got architectural capacity, has got engineering capacity. The public sector in this case includes universities with all the research capacity. They can help small communities develop stuff. And finally, one of the things that come, and I said this yesterday, I think, I keep hearing the Green New Deal is going to be solved by job guarantee. Well, the job guarantee is a buffer stock system. It's a base piece of policy infrastructure that is there to, to provide an opportunity for the most disadvantaged workers in our community who typically bear the brunt of unemployment. It's not meant to be a solution to the sort of scale that we're talking about here and the sort of skill development and the training and the, and the innovation and the nous that we're going to require. The job guarantee is an essential equity and inflation fighting measure, but it shouldn't be asked to do too much. All right, last few points. So that's a big thing, isn't it? And uh, that big thing, which is massive, and, and, and when I think about the social and the economic sort of labour market issues involved in that, I say to myself, well, if the climate change scientists are right, well, then we're pretty cooked, because this is going to take quite a long time. 
and it's going to require massive transformations and the, 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 the losers of all of that because there's going to be people losing, there's going to be communities losing and so we have to, you'll note that I didn't talk about climate there at all, but all of that's related to climate. But the, what, what, that, what that framework allows us to do is to make sure there are no losers. The ones that lose their jobs now know that this framework's going to be able to provide them with an ongoing sustainable future. Now, I, I, I understand the arguments the CFME you make to me that I'll... A coal worker does not want to become a checkout operator. But that's not what we're talking about at all. You know, we put a person on the moon when I was still in high school. You imagine the technological uh, challenge that that was before all of the sort of networking and uh, uh, scientific capacity we've got now. If we can do it then, we can create with our imagination really good transition opportunities for skilled workers. And we know how we're going to pay for it, that's MMT. Now, last few slides. And this is, a, this is sort of a semi-announcement. What, we, what, we, what, what, what I've concluded with some others is that our major political parties are basically moribund. That the Greens are problematic. And there's all sorts of reasons why this is the case. Uh, on, but that's, the, that's relying on the Greens to be the climate action, green transition political force, I wouldn't rely on them. Uh, and what we need to change all of that and to reinvigorate our political parties so that they become voices for us again, whether they were, I'm not sure, but I think they were when I was younger, a bit more than they are now. Uh, uh, particularly the Labor Party. Uh, what we need, in my view, is a new coalition that marries MMT to the social and environment elements that I've been talking about. And we also need to start with the recognition that if we abandon the elements that are going to lose out initially from this transformation, uh, that tie all of those communities together, then we won't make any progress. So the priority's got to be jobs. Now, how many people know about the Power Manifesto 1971? I won't get you to stand up. <laughs> A very small number. Lewis Power was an American lawyer. He was hired by the Chamber of Commerce in the United States to all the debate in the late 60s and was about uh, uh, the profit squeeze, it was called. It was how the social democratic system had empowered trade unions, had empowered people to want more out of the, the income that was being produced by the economy. And there was more of that going to workers and labour and that was squeezing the profit share. And capital was saying, this is unsustainable, we need more. Uh, when do they ever say less? And uh, uh, I've done a lot of work over the years for the unions on the national wage case. There's never been once that, I, that I've understood that the uh, workers would get a pay increase if it was up to the employers. Um, and what Lewis Powell was in, uh, commissioned to do was come up with a strategic agenda to wrest back control from uh, what they called the communists and the socialists. Who, uh, uh, this was just normal working people. Uh, and uh, Powell came up with this blueprint, and I urge all progressives to read it, because we can s almost cut and paste our version into it to be a progressive manifesto. What uh, Lewis Powell, and by the way, it was just after he published this, he was appointed by President Nixon to the Supreme Court and he was arguably the most conservative Supreme Court judge in American history. So he was a right. <laughs> You're allowed to swear, but I won't. These days. Um, and, you know, he, his manifesto, we've got to create think tanks. 
And that was the era of all the think tanks started to be created. In Australia, we got CIS and the you know, uh, HR Nichols Society, if you remember. You'll remember that, Jeff. Yeah, and, and, and in America, you know, had all these think tanks really s growing and getting well-funded by capital, industrial capital, the Koch brothers, Wall Street, Peter Peterson, all of these propaganda machines, which were extremely well-funded, which were extremely well-staffed with very skilled researchers and operators, which were extremely well-staffed with high-quality marketing and journalists, capacity who would pump out research all the time to alter the debate. He also advocated infiltrating the education system, particularly the social sciences, to weed out the communists and to start an educational narrative that would promote free market capitalism. And a, as a funny aside, some years ago I came across a CIA document from the, the late 60s. And uh, for all you Marxists, you, you'll get a kick out of this. I did. The, the, so you know about the rise of continental Marxism and, and Foucault and all the rest of it, which became rather abstruse for a basic industrial Marxist like me. Uh, very postmodern. Anyway, what it was real, and, and these guys started, these French and continental Marxists started to appear all around the world, holding workshops and espousing these ideas that were virtually incomprehensible. Anyway, it was later, it's now been revealed that the CIA was sponsoring them <laughs> because they knew they were so wacky that it would turn everybody off who had any tendency to become Marxists, it would turn them off. This was all part of this strategy. And the other thing Powell said, there were other things, but the other main thing was that the, the right had to create a media presence, a mass media presence. And that's where you get Fox News from. And whatever you ask, you've got Sky News and, and Murdoch's and those sort of things. And the right have always been really united in being able to do that sort of stuff. They seem to be able to put their factional differences and their personal differences aside and be extremely sophist uh, sophisticated in their strategies. Now, that, it's helped that they've got a lot of money. Uh, the left has never been really good at understanding that sort of strategic challenge. And the left usually fractures. I remember when I was a, a, a student in Melbourne in the 70s, there were three communist parties. Trots, Maoists and Marxist-Leninists. And, they'd, they'd, and the Trots would march into uh, uh, political economy conferences with megaphones shouting, we've got to close this down, the Marxist-Leninists are here. <laughs> and we fracture. We divert our energy and our, our empowerment by fighting among ourselves too often. So here is what I'm planning to do about it. These are the goals. Green transition, with all of those elements in that matrix I showed you. And that's contestable, the matrix, but that's just a thought experiment at this stage. What I think we need to do, and this is uh, coming out of me channeling with my colleagues, the POW manifesto, the most successful transformation in it was the basis of neoliberalism. It, it's been incredibly successful. In the, the report card says it's been shocking, but it, that, they don't care about all those things. It's been incredibly successful in advancing the agenda that they set themselves in the early 70s. And so this is our agenda, a multi-layered capacity. We're going to create a think tank, which will be a consortium of think tanks that currently exist, including my own, the Centre of Full Employment, including the Cape York Institute. My part, one of my partners in this who is, who's allowed me today to uh, disclose that is Noel Pearson. Noel Pearson, for those who don't know, was the lawyer who helped the Mabo decision. High profile person. Tells me he gets on the phone to Scott Morrison. 
Noel rang me a while back, he'd bought my textbook, our textbook, and he said to me, if I had known this sort of stuff in the 80s, things would be a lot more, a lot different. He'd, he'd accepted the economic mainstream. It's really powerful that we've got Noel in our consortium uh, as an, as an indig indigenous leader, as a high profile political player and a really clever and nice guy. The other partner that I'm not allowed to disclose the name yet is a, glo a leading global climate action group. There's not too many of them. We've also got sociologists from academia. Uh, I've invited a, the leading ecological economist in Australia who's in this room to join our consortium. And uh, we plan to create a think tank based upon that capacity along the lines of the Power Manifesto advocacy. We're going to create a... So my, in, in coffee, my research centre, the thing that's always constrained us is money. I have to compete for all the money I ever get and it's not, and, and in scale of things, you know, it's millions of dollars, not 50 millions of dollars. And so it means that we've always had to just do research and uh, I've got to be the marketing arm and I guess that's a bit of a problem, eh? And uh, so we're going to create this think tank will have a dissemination capacity other than a research capacity. It's going to be a propaganda machine with top class marketing and press liaison. And, you know, all of the consortium partners have really close relationships with all the press. And uh, so we're going to build on that and we're going to be pumping out press releases to influence the debate. And it's unashamed we're going to be a propaganda institute because that's the way the right wins. And we're going to have educational outreach. This is the MMT Ed project that I'm building and seeking funding for. And my first MMT pro, uh, uh, effort is a masterclass in London in February, on February 24. It just got sold out. I'm really happy about that. And we're going to go out to all, not just Sydney and London and Tokyo and places, we're going to go out to Mary Wall and all sorts of off the normal urban path to educate and talk about MMT and about these issues so that people are empowered, as I said yesterday, by knowledge. Uh, we're going to have... Uh, Provide, we're aiming to provide logistic, financial and mentoring support for community action. Because this is just going to be a facilitator, if it, in a sense. The only way it's going to work is if everyone in this room plus everyone in every, every other room get be empowered to do stuff. Not necessarily what we want, specifically not as our agents, but as their agents. Uh, because what I understand is that I do a lot of work for community groups and they've just got nothing, no strategic support. Uh, they, you know, there are a few, often a, a few retired people who are just trying to defend their communities and they need logistic and, and skills. This group will provide them. Uh, and part of that will be I'm aiming to set up a power company. There's now, you can now do it. There's software available where we can set up, set up, if you're on the national grid, we can, you can join our power company. And we can run equity programs where those who have got, uh, generate too much power can give it away for free to people who deserve to have free power, who haven't got the income that others have in the, in the collective. All of us can do that. <laughs> We've got the technology to do that. And we'll, well, the aim is to put the big power companies out of business. And we're also going to have political engagement. So it's not just sitting out there pumping out propaganda. The aim is to actually grab them by the collar and get them to change their views and to try to revitalise our political parties. And uh, that, you know, that's the political mobilisation. We, 
th- these things are still in incubation stage, let me add. And uh, uh, political mobilisation is, you know, we're not yet talking about starting a political party and I don't think that's going to come out of this initiative. But I know people that do want to start political parties and do want to steal people from existing political parties who are sick of them and want to start grassroots movements and we might try to work out ways to help them. So we'll, we'll, we'll announce something, I hope, very big very soon as a national plan with global implications for Australia to marry MMT with climate action and green transition and provide a power manifesto version for progressives. Leading ecological (laughs) conflict. Five minutes for questions, so uh, yeah, I saw a hand there. So, uh. yeah, do you need it? Yeah, thanks for that, Bill. I'm really heartened by that. A uh, couple of things, though, that I think are negatives uh, related to the Powell Manifesto. Uh, Nancy McLean produced a book called. Yeah. A democracy in Chains, looking at the role of Buchanan with the Koch brothers. Mm. So they've had 50-plus years of their propaganda taking root and people believing this. So I think it's a massive job to turn that around. Allied to the job creation is the myth of the doll bludger, which um, originated in Australia with Clyde Cameron in 1974. So we've got 45, 46 years of that. And that's, I think, uh, something that mitigates against the idea of creating do- a job creation scheme. So I just wondered if, what your thoughts on the timing of this and how soon things could be turned around. Yeah, well, I, I not, not soon. Um, one of the projects that I'm involved in with Dr Louisa Connors is uh, involved in learning about framing and lang- use of language and the way in which metaphors are used, like doll bludgers and stuff, to, to divide and conquer us, for example, and to serve special interests. And, um, you know, I've been an educator all my life, and I'm fully aware of the, the slow burn process of education. And, uh, uh, and that's why I said that if the climate change scientists are dead right, then we're cooked, because this is going to take too long. But... Uh, Let's hope they're not exactly right. And the point I'd make is that uh, uh, it's a massive challenge. Uh, It's almost beyond belief when you look at all the components that have to be attended to. But if you don't start somewhere, and we mightn't be successful, we might end up embittered Melbourne supporters. You're already embittered if you're a Melbourne supporter, by the way. Uh, but we, we just feel as though this is the thing we've got to do now. And uh, uh, now that more people who are high profile are starting, like Noel, who are starting to really embrace my work, MMT, that I, I sense there's a real... In, in Woodford, I gave a talk at Woodford Festival the other day north of Brisbane. There was quite a big crowd of people who... who and, and the, one of the a, a young person said to me, he said he was sort of a hippie, and uh, he s- explained to me how you know he was the only thing he, he thought he had for his future was the gig economy. And he said that listening about MMT and green stuff and that for the first time in his life, he might have been about twenty, I reckon, eight years of age. He said, that's the first time I think there could be hope. (laughs) 
So my view is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's all, I wake up in the morning, go running and think this is an insurmountable challenge. But I quite like challenges. So. And I've been, I, I've been uh, running against the stream all my academic career, so why not? Why stop now? Uh, is it possible to expand just a little bit on uh, your comments about the Greens? Um, there, um, Sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> could you expand, perhaps, just a little bit on, upon your comments about the Greens being problematic? Uh, not really. <laughs> you must have something, right? Uh, the, the Greens the only do thing, have as part of their policy, the only they are working I'd... on a Green New Deal, they are working on a just, just transition. I understand all that, and I've had close contacts with the Greens, senior leadership of the Greens for years. The Greens uh, believe that the uh, transition could be made through the price system, and they also have a fiscally conservative outlook, and they don't challenge the fiscal surplus obsession. And uh, I've had talks with the leaders over many years about why don't they embrace MMT, and one of the most famous leaders said to me, he said, you might be right, Bill, but he said, we, that would be too hard for us to sell to people. And so we prefer to adopt the mainstream fiscal and economic policy consensus so that we can concentrate our campaigns on our real agenda, the environment. And I said to him, so you prefer to lie to the people and you should realise, in my view, you won't be able to achieve your social and environmental agenda while you buy into the mainstream neoliberal macroeconomics. Yeah, that just reminds me, Richard, Richard Di Natale saying there's no alternative to capitalism or something along those lines. Yeah. I don't think he knows what it actually means. But my, I just wanted to make one comment about the public banks. I know we don't have a public bank in Australia at the moment, but we do have a union-run bank called Members' Equity. So if everybody in this room and all your friends and family change your bank over to Members' Equity, they're a non-profit run by a union, no bank fees. You have a, there's no branches that you go to, but you just use Bank SA and Westpac. Please use the post office. And they're great. I've had them for, ever since I came, for the last six, seven years. And they're an alternative to the profit-making... Yeah. Central banks. And if you didn't want to do that, you could uh, transfer all your business into the Newcastle Permanent, which is a really great sort of uh, uh, collective, collectively owned building society that now operates as a bank. So we do have those sort of organisations, that's true. And, but the message is, if I was you, I would transfer all my business from the big four banks on Monday. And, and that, that's related to something that I think is important. One of, the, one of the ways in which us as relatively powerless people, households, when you think about it, what, what these big firms want is to make accumulate profits. They lobby the hell out of governments to shift the market in their favour, to get uh, handouts... Uh, uh, bailouts and handouts and all the rest of it. But what, what their objective is to get returns for their shareholders. And the only way they can really get those returns, ultimately when you think about it, is if we buy their stuff. And so we actually do have power. We could organise, and we've got the uh, technology now to do it, internet, we, and we've got anonymous technology that would allow us to do it. We, we should just be organising consumer boycotts all the time. And that's part of this get, get out of the banks. Look, we've only got time for one more question, so I'm sorry for all those people who will miss out. Uh, you can perhaps catch up with Bill afterwards. I don't know how long Bill's going to be around. I'll be here this afternoon. Yeah, no, okay. um, yeah. So, uh, just some disclosures. So, I'm a member of the Labor left um, um, and have gladly moved motions um, and had motions passed um, with regards to a green revolution at the last Young Labor annual general meeting in South Australia. Um, 
uh, we called it also well, a green revolution, um, and it incorporated a jobs guarantee in a federal government as an employer of last resort. Um, so I'm fully on board with um, MMT principles, and I think lots of young people in the party are. Um, my question, therefore, is um, a few, uh, I wanted you to clarify some internal inconsistencies that I've just picked up from your speech, which was, I guess, not splitting the left, um, which is very hard to do, mind you, um, but also, um, I guess, your approach to their um, political engagement, the major parties and, and you know, dare I say it, the Greens. Um, uh, it, how do you how do you reconcile that? Um, you, you said you lent support possibly to a new party, um, and if that's not splitting uh, and, and fracturing the left, then I don't know what is. Yeah, it's a good. I said we might lend support for a new party, we might. But if you think about uh, the, the 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 existing party memberships are not set in stone. And, uh, for example, I'm, I'm giving advice to Malachon's, Jean, Jean-Luc Malachon's group in Paris, in France. And that's a breakaway from the Socialist Party. Now, the breakaway movement is incredibly progressive. The, the, the elements of the Socialist Party they broke away from are very unprogressive. And so when you say you're splitting the left, do you think I'm splitting the left by talking to Jean-Luc Mélenchon's group? I don't think so. I think I'm empowering the left. And uh, uh, because you, we've got to ask ourselves the question, is the existing factional structures of our parties, particularly the Labor Party, the particular way in which it's the national conference is structured, the influence of various factions, do we really think that's representative of what we call the left. There are certain elements in the Labor Party that clearly are representative of the left. And there are certain elements, by the way, in the Liberal Party that are quite progressive. I talk to them. And if we dream big, we'd want a whole left party. Look at the British Labor Party. I give advice to them. Look at what's happened to them because of the, the, the fact that the left element is being, has been killed off by the Blairites. The Blairites preferred to lose, I reckon, than to have Jeremy as the Prime Minister. So I don't see it as uh, splitting the left at all. I see it as encouraging left elements in society to, to form viable political voices whether that means a new party or whether it means takeover of their branches within their existing structure or whatever, I see that as being empowering the left because otherwise we're never going to get anywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.